It's good to again be with my brothers and sisters of the UU and some friends and family that have joined in. What I'm going to speak about today is something that has changed my life over the last couple of years. As you heard in my introduction, I'm usually working on finding common ground. But as of late, some things that have happened that has kind of jolted my thinking. You see, I started to believe that I'm on a trail, a trail of tears, things that have happened that hurt me as I go along the way. Those hurts turn into learning, yes, but they do hurt. It's like someone stepping on your toes daily. Now, here in America, we don't like people stepping on our toes. In fact, as far back, if someone stepped on our toes, we learned to protest or have demonstrations. And we kind of started that with the Boston Tea Party. And if you really want to show protests, the women's suffrage, wasn't that something? Then we had civil rights. Along with that came the athletes because the black community was not getting the recognition that they needed to get their point across. So athletes stepped out and during the 68 Olympics, Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised a fist, a gloved black fist in accepting their medals for the 200 meter sprint. When they did that, they were stripped of those medals. And from that point on, very few, if any, athletes ever spoke out. I think Muhammad Ali was one of the few. That was until 2016. And a gentleman by the name of Kaepernick, a football player in San Francisco, knelt down at the beginning of the national anthem. Boy, did that set things off here. The fans decided they were gonna burn his jerseys. Those with season tickets threatened to boycott the stadium. People were gonna boycott different radio stations, TV stations. The owners, they were getting to the point that they were going to find the players because the players had decided, you know, these, this man is right. We're going to join in, black or white players. It got to be pretty nasty. And then came George Floyd. And not only did America see, but the world got to see the other side of the American city. We got to see a man of full health die in front of our eyes over and over and over again. That threw me, it changed me. I wasn't sure what to do because I knew I had to do something because I remember that talk from my father about when I was out driving, how to carry myself in the streets so that I wouldn't be picked off by the police. I decided that I would write a presentation, something I could start out giving to Toastmasters to let them see that this was not about the flag. It was not about the anthem. It was about getting respect and justice in our community. Because in the past, someone doing, uh, killing a black man would never, never go to justice. So I put together a presentation and a couple weeks later, I stood in front of my club and I presented it. Everything seemed to go okay. A week later, I had my bottom handed to me. 
You see this lady, a veteran, she felt that I had disrespected the flag and the anthem, that she had spent all her life in the service protecting that flag, protecting this country. Her father had retired from the service. And when he died, they laid a flag, the United States flag over his casket. They gave him a 21 gun salute. And then they folded that flag and on one knee, they handed it to her mother. Now that may not seem like much to you, but that knocked me off my feet. You see, she didn't hear anything about my community. She went to the flag and to the anthem. It is the way people do not hear my community. They don't hear what we're saying. They switch the narrative. I started to put together a presentation to tell her how I felt about it. And you know what? That's when the pandemic came in. So can I share it with you? This is what I wanted to tell her. You see, lady, my veteran friend, I know your father fought in the Second World War, but so did my father. Coming from a, the South, that really didn't want him there. The Jim Crow South, where he wasn't respected at all. When he joined the service or was pulled into the service, he was living in Philadelphia. He served his country well. And when he came home in uniform, he took that trip back to Philadelphia on the bus. In the back of the bus, in uniform under that flag. And when they stopped to eat, my father could not go to the front of that restaurant and order his food, nor eat inside. He had to go to the back of the restaurant, order his food and sit out on picnic tables, rain or shine, in his uniform under that flag but maybe he could gain something from that GI Bill. So getting back into the real world, he wanted to apply to colleges so that he could get an education. And they said, Negroes need not apply in uniform under the flag. But they also had a housing section in there. He could use that, couldn't he? They were building new homes, hundreds, thousands of homes in the suburbs. They were building them outside of Philadelphia in a place called Levittown. And the sign there read, no Negroes should apply in uniform under that flag. My father didn't give up and that was the one main thing he gave me. My dad got a position at the Treasury Department, the United States Treasury Department. And there he took on different responsibilities. He became a US Marshal. He was drafted into the Secret Service for a while and he actually took and guarded JFK's limo when he came to Philadelphia. He trained Sky Marshals. He became the assistant director of customs in our area. And before he retired, he was the security executive for the Philadelphia airport. And when my dad died, there was no less than seven limos going up the highway in Philadelphia, escorted by six motorcycle policemen. And he too got a 21 gun salute. And they folded that flag and handed it to my mother. You see that young lady had stepped on my toes. I was back on that trail of tears and I didn't even know about that trail 
until she had done that. And it hurt. It hurt bad. I, it hurt that I couldn't defend my father in front of her. But I realized that from that time on, like I am sharing this with you, this is a story I would have never have shared before. But I have this and more that I will share because it, we should know that a lot of things have been hidden and when something like George Floyd happens, there's an explosion. And that explosion comes from lots and lots of problems that have happened before. I'd like to share with you uh, one of mine. And it happened when I was a, a teenager. I was a freshman in high school and loved to swim. I just started out to join the swim team. And as I was about to enter the pool area, Five white guys surrounded me and I thought, oh boy, I got a problem here. And you know what? It turned out to be okay. These guys were all right. They wanted to who I wanted to know who I was, what strokes did I do, whatever. And when I told them I do the butterfly, and that's what I was going to try out for, one of them said, Oh no, you you can't do the butterfly. I said, I can't. He said, No. I said, why? He said, well, black people have a different physiology of their chest area, and you won't be able to bring your arms around enough. You will be disqualified. Oh, I didn't know that. So I went up and I tried out for freestyle and I made the team. Several week, weeks later, my older cousin came and he was so proud of me getting on the team. He asked, how did I do? And I said, fine. He says, well, yeah, you're swimming that butterfly, right? And I told him the story. Uh, in my community, we have a way of getting our point across. And my cousin reached out and whacked me across my head. And I stepped back and said, what are you doing? And he put his finger in my face and he said, let me tell you something. Don't you ever let somebody tell you you can't do something, especially when you've already been doing it. You see, the place where we were doing our tryouts was the YMCA that I went to summer camp, five days a week. And two of those hours each day, I swam the butterfly. So he sent me back and I went to the coach and asked him, can I try out for the butterfly? And I made the team doing the 50 meter butterfly. Now I did get to go to the city finals, but that was ugly and another story we don't wanna talk about. I did not do very well. But as I went on, there was one more I wanna share with you. I had the opportunity to buy a home. I had been working for IBM for quite a while. And when you have IBM in your pedigree, you were able to do things other people weren't necessarily able to do. It's almost like having Google or Apple. And at that time I found this place and my neighbor became my best friend. Would you believe it was a cop? He was one of the policemen for the town I was living in. And the town's name was called Conshohocken. Yep, Conshohocken. It's between Philadelphia and Valley Forge. He was Polish. He taught me how to eat Polish food from pierogies and knockwurst. And I taught him fried chicken and barbecued ribs. And even today, we are the best of friends. And when his daughters got married, I came from Minnesota to their weddings. But this day was the first year I had lived there. And as I was going in the house, he drove up in the police cruiser and he said, hey, have you voted yet? I said, no. He said, well, come on and go vote. And I said, well, I'll, I, in a minute. He said, no, no, come on now, I'll follow you. 
I said, I know the way. He said, come on. So I went in the car and I got to the voting place, which was an old mansion they had made into the city hall. Very large doors in the front. And as I entered and closed the door, a lady came up to me and she said, can I help you? Yes, ma'am, I come to vote. You don't vote here. I don't vote here? No. And she proceeded to give me directions to another place. And as I turned to leave, I turned around and said, ma'am, why is it that I don't vote here, but my neighbor votes here? Well, what's your address? I gave her my address. She went and took a look and was surprised to find it. She said, can I have your, your signature? So I went over and I signed the book and she had four or five people verify it. I got my ballot, completed it. And when I came out, that police cruiser was rocking back and forth. And I could hear Paul dying in laughter on the inside of that car. I said, he said, you had problems, didn't you? And I said, yeah, and he just kept on laughing. He said, I knew you were. And I said, why, what, what's wrong? He said, you were the first black person that's ever walked through those doors to vote. And you know, I had to kind of chuckle too, because yeah, I was the first black person that had ever moved into that section of town. Today, I don't find it funny. They stepped on my toes. You see, when this gentleman told me that my physiology was different, where did he get that from? That says I am different, but I'm not. There's, those things does not, do not exist. And if he believed that, what else did he believe about me? What else was he sharing with his family? What as a young man and having a family of his own, was he sharing with them? At voting, how could this woman just look at me walking in that door and assume I did not vote there? If that's not racism, what is? Again, I got my toes stepped on. Every day I have to be concerned about when my toes will be stepped on. It may not come today and tomorrow may be twice. The two stories I told you were from the past kind of. No reason to dig up too, too much. But you may be thinking, you know, well, that was the past, so what could kind of happen today is a little bit different. Well, I'd like to show you a picture now. This happened approximately, so I'd say six, seven years ago during bike week in Ormond Beach in front of the Iron Horse Saloon. My friend and I were sitting there and a gentleman came by in a wheelchair. And I noticed people turning around and pointing at the back of his shirt. And so being the curious person I was, I got up to see what they were looking at. I rushed back to get my camera and my friend said, what did it say? And I told her, she said, don't go back, don't go back, you, you could cause trouble. I said, nobody would ever believe me if I didn't have a picture of this. And this is what I saw. As you see there, it said, nigger please, it's a White House. I got my toes stepped on. Melissa, thank you.